Uh, welcome, ma'am. Am I audible? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, good afternoon, friends, colleagues, and the participants. I hope you all found the previous session to be engaging. So now please allow me to welcome you all to the second part of today's agenda. So I'm Vikram, I teach history at Bahana College. And uh, before we start, let me wish you all a stimulating, engaging, and uh, productive session. So the topic of today's session is textbook publishing from author's perspective. Uh, as actively involved in the academy, I'm sure you all are aware of what a Hathulian and uh, Gargantuan task writing textbook is. It requires a lot of planning. It has a lot of logistics involved. And of course, it has a lot of ethical concerns involved as well. So uh, sometimes we have often, often found that although many of you, I'm pretty sure you're uh, involved in the act of writing textbooks, but sometimes we are, sometimes we, found, uh, we find ourselves in situations we uh, have certain doubts or certain confusion, or sometimes we need certain technical issues to be clear. So uh, we basically have an overarching overview regarding what textbook writing is, what are the issues that need, we need to be concerned about, what are the basically keys to be crossed or I's to be dotted, um, what are the do's and don'ts we are basically having today, sir. So for this, uh, we have an expert with us, uh, a person who has years of experience in writing textbooks, not only textbooks, but also in uh, rigorous academic research. We have uh, Dr. Susmita Priyarasini Man from Devi Saran Bura College College, Sohat. So um, she has a stellar academic career behind her. Uh, in addition to being a gold medalist from her university, she's also a PhD. She has written nine textbooks and reference books. Reference book. she, she was also a member of numerous advisory committees of the, uh, of the government. And in addition to that, she has published quite a large number of research in her own field. So we are basically today very privileged and honored to have you with us, ma'am. And without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to you, ma'am. But uh, before we begin today's session, I'd like to uh, request the participants a few things. First, please uh, keep your microphones muted and the videos switch off while the speaker is delivering her address. Second, uh, if you have any queries, suggestions, or questions for a speaker, then please type them on the chat box, uh, the chat box of your Google Meet interface, or you may address them directly to the speaker once he is done with her speech. So without further ado, we'll, uh, we'd now like to start. Over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. At the outset, I would like to thank Department of Economics, Mahana College, for organizing a national workshop on a topic which will be beneficial for the students, teachers, and would be authors. I know it is a part of the work that have been doing by the department for several years at the interest of the students and teachers. Congratulations to them. Of course, at first I would like to admit that I'm not an expert in the subject, but I'm certain I learn a lot from you, from the discussion, 
from the observation. So you people may not be uh, enraged by my uh, deliberation, but I will surely be. That's why I'm with you for today. I would like to beg a minute from you to open the PPT. So my topic for today is on textbook writing, author's perspective. Let's start with the author's perspective. Author's perspective refers to the way an author looks at the topic or idea. But nowadays, textbook writer cannot publish a book completely ignoring the ethical aspect of it. Perhaps that is the reason for which your organizer has included ethical aspects in this workshop. Therefore, this deliberation is divided into two parts. First part deals with the whole process of textbook writing of course, that is from the point of view of the authors, what it actually the author has to do. And the second part deals with ethical issues that matter in case of textbook writing. I'd like to make it clear that this deliberation will not consult or discuss any theories of textbook writing because uh, the topic is from the point of view of the authors. Let's start with the first part, part one. Why a person thinks about writing a book, the first question that comes to him is, why should I write a textbook? That is his idea. That is, uh, there may be several reasons for it. There is no textbook on that particular subject. Existing textbooks are not good. Or he may want to do something different for students. Because from his years of experience, he can now say what will be easy to understand for the student and what will be difficult for the students. Or he may be interested with the task of writing the textbook by the state board or central board or board of studies. Because state board, central board or board of studies can select or choose any person who they consider as an expert in the field. After that, the second question is market. For whom to write? Who will read my book? First semester student, second semester student, fourth, fifth, or sixth semester undergraduate student, or postgraduate student, or vocational students. Because the text were written for first semester, if the topic is same, will be different from, from the book written for the sixth semester or the post graduate students. So it matters. Second thing is, will it add up my book? University, autonomous colleges, vocational institution. This matters because 
university has certain guidelines for writing a textbook, autonomous colleges, and also for the studies, vocational institution, records, books, according to their convenience. Third is materials. Of course, it will depend on the syllabus. Next is identification of sources of materials. If I am going to write a book on economics or literature, I will have to collect sources of materials. For this, systematic collection of material over time is required. It is not like that within one month or two months, I'll collect the material and finish the job. Then the result may not be the good for the students. Then what is required is induction of materials. That is very important actually, because these days you have to consider all the ethical aspects related to the book writing and book publishing. Therefore, indexing matters because you are to cite everything. And it generally happens when we write something without considering or we forget the choice of the materials. That's why indexing has record. Next is secret plan. They say about the length of the book. What will be the charge of the book? 300 pages, 600 pages, 900 pages. Why the length of the book or choice matters? I would like to explain with an example. Actually, these days there is a, a famous writer, reputed writer of economics, uh, which books are uh, sold generally as a pot kick in. Uh, all the shops of the states. Uh, but uh, what happens, uh, he suddenly uh, wrote a book which can be called overcharged. Too large, so many pages. I gave it to one of my uh, brilliant students. She kept the book for two days. And after two days, she returned the book to me. I asked, why? You were returning the book within two days. She told me, ma'am, it is not possible for me to read this book. It is too lengthy. Even I, I, I am scared of reading this book. This book saves me in a dream, actually. I cannot think if I see the book, I think, ah, oh, God, I have to read this whole book. Of course, this was a very good book updated and therefore uh, you see it is the choice that really matters of course it depends on the syllabus number of units etc but it should not be too lengthy so that it cannot be completed by the students within the time okay it is a quality if, a author, uh, if an author can complete the book within limited or appropriate number of pages, it should not be too lengthy. It should not be oversized or undersized. Next is depending on the topic, the book may be divided into parts. Little troubles are. Uh, mm, one person is going to write a book on statistics. And according to syllabus, there is two parts. One is statistical theories and other is application. So you can uh, divide the book in two parts as first part consists of the statistical theories. Of course, it is compulsory to include worked out examples in the first part. In the second part, he should include the application. That is the application. Statistical application is the uh, second part. So you can uh, teach the 
students through this part how to prepare a project, how to forecast national income, GDP, or other figures, and how to uh, 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 how to um, extrapolate or interpolate data which were making in certain government data or in certain data set. Okay. So uh, that will be rather easy for the students because the book will be systematic. And the number of chapters to be included should be fixed. Generally, it depends on the syllabus. Numbers depends on the syllabus. We will go to the second slide for this. And sector titles, of course, tentative sector titles should be fixed. And second job is to draw sector. Sector, if you are going to draw the sector, first you are to think about the organization of chapter in the fixed book. What you should do according to the syllabus? Sometimes it happens that uh, one, top, one topic of the first chapter is related to the second topic of the uh, another topic of the second chapter. Then you can lump the chapters. Uh, or uh, if suppose one topic or uh, one small topic in the first unit is related to the to another topic in the fourth unit. So uh, there may be uh, several similarities. So in that case, you will better arrange the book according to the relation of the items. This item relate with this, so it should come up to this. This serialty should be uh, this uh, should be maintained actually. This order should be maintained. Uh, and in case of arranging the individual chapters, same rule can be followed. Let us suppose you are going to write a book on literature in Assamage. So what we will do? You will start with the Adi Chuk, then Madha Chuk, then come to the Adhani Chuk. And if you start with the Adhani Chuk, which is actually known or the students are familiar with it. So if you start with the modern age or the Adhani Chuk, and then if you go to the Adi Chuk, it will be inconvenient for the student to cross. Next is write to sector text and include safe charts, diagrams, tables. But the question is, what should be the number of diagrams? It doesn't mean that several diagrams or uh, that many diagrams can make it easy for the students to understand. There may be two or three full diagrams which can explain a certain thing clearly. So it will require the expertise of the uh, author. Then record the tables. And in this case also, it will depend on the topic. How can it be possible to explain the matter with the help of the tables? Of course, in case of certain database or information-based sector, you are to uh, actually if you are compelled to include tables, if you are going to write a book on Indian economy, how can you have a table? Next is footnotes and endnotes are given for the convenience of the students as well as the teachers. Footnotes is required because uh, uh, you are including a table on the uh, GDP data for 10 years. But one data is of current year. One datum is of current year. So for the current year, no data is available. So what will you do? You'll estimate the data, and it should be clearly stated in the footnote that it is an estimate. That is not a real data or actual data. Next, uh, in order to introduce with some new concepts, AutoCAN 
try uh, or start with some examples. If one person is writing a book on physics and uh, the sector is on motion, he can start with an example of a moving object. Then he should generalize it. And after that, he should include more example to make the concept clear to the students. It will be easy. So, uh, author, from author's point of view, what should be his idea? That is to, from which example I should start the sector? What kind of examples will be easy for the student to grasp? So uh, it is required to draw the examples from the environment in which the student is living. Sufficient worked out examples should be included. Of course, it may not be so for all the subjects. For example, in case of literature, textbooks should not for extremely meritorious students only. That is the reason why there are so many guidebooks and reference books are in work. Textbooks are for all the students below average and above average. So it should be written in a way that it is understandable for all the students. So author should first convince himself or herself that I'm going to write a book which will, be, which will be fruitful for all the students. So uh, what is required? The author should be determined to follow integrity, follow all, follow all the principles of textbook writing so that the outcome becomes useful for the students. And in the end, there should be summary of the sector. But that summary should be by point by point, not in the way that one paragraph is written as a summary. That will not work. And if you are writing a book for the young minds, then it should be extra careful. So the author should be extra careful that I should summarize the sector point by point. Next is exercises, descriptive, numerical, or multiple choice questions. Of course, the writer can add glossary on the sector at the end of the every sector, or he can edit in the end part of the sector. So the author has to decide. What will be beneficial for the students? Should I aid the glossary at the end of the sector or at the end of the book? But for the convenience of the reader, it is certain that he has to include three things. First is glossary, second is bibliography, and third is in that. Of course, Bibliography is a, a moral requirement, actually. That is to ascertain that the work is an honest work. It is not a tapped course, which we'll uh, discuss in our second part. But glossary is required. But because it is, uh, it happens that the student is reading the second sector where one word from the first sector is used and he uh, he forgets the term. So he requires the term, what is the meaning of it or the definition immediately. So he can go to the glossary of the second sector, uh, the first sector, or he can go to the uh, end part of the book where glossary is added. Next is from collection to drafting sector. Instructions given by the state, central board, syllabus committee, board of studies should be strictly followed. 
because these instructions are prepared by committee consisting of experts. Okay. So uh, these are for the benefits of the students. So you don't have the liberty. Otto soon convince himself or ourselves that I don't have much liberty. I have to follow the principles. If they have given certain uh, instruction for informational text, then you are to follow those. Next work is proofreading and class testing. All the textbook writer actually find this work boring and monotonous. But it is the most necessary work which he cannot escape from. Look for arrows first in the already tough proof copy. Correction can be done through class test also. Suppose an author is writing a book on probability and uh, he has given certain sounds from that sector to his students or, uh, or give him the assignment, uh, give them the assignment to write about certain concepts related to probability, for example, random experiment, agnostic cases, etc. If the students fail to answer a single question or most of them or certain question, that means what? Uh, there may be certain mistake in your sector. It may not be intelligible for the students. So you have to ask your student, what happens to them? What is the problem? Uh, is there any problem in understanding the sector? Which portion they have found uh, difficult in this way, you can correct or can correct actually is correct is sectors through clusters major changes of course should not be met at the time of group reading i think it will not be easy to guess what will happen if you make major changes in the sector at the time of group reading next comes editing and publication this work is optional. Actually, if the book is not published by the national publisher, then you are the editor. The book will not pass through any professional editing in this way. And therefore, you are to edit the book. It was to make correction and updating. Okay. And then you have to submit the book to the publisher and you will print it. But you have to be careful in the whole process because the students, because the public wants integrity from you. Next is first edition of the book may not be the perfect one. It often happens from the reaction we generally make the correction. Author tries to improve the subsequent edition. Next is marketing. Except in case of self-publication, marketing is done by the publisher or the distribution. Uh, so you are free from this job actually. In case of self-publication, textbooks should be brought to the market at right time. So that students should not run helter skelter in charge of the textbook. It generally happens when syllabus is changed or curriculum is changed. You all can remember, you all teachers, participants can remember what happened at the time of introduction of semester and at the time of CBCS course. There was doubt of textbook. Not only the student, we teachers ran a uh, helter skelter in search of textbooks. So it is the moral responsibility actually. Uh, to bring the textbook at the right time so that the students 
are valid feature. If the session starts in August and the textbook comes in uh, November, then what will happen to the students? Not only for the students, it is actually uh, very difficult for the teachers to complete the course if there is that of textbooks. So this is related to the process of textbook writing from drafting to marketing. So uh, this is the process. Of course, we is division cannot be called watertight. That is, the first part is not related to the second part, which is related to the second part, which is related to ethics. So come to ethics. What is the ethical responsibility of the textbook writer? Ethics does not mean it legal, but it should be morally just. Now, first requirement, or you can say ethical responsibility of a writer is that any person who wants to write a book should ask himself whether he is fit for the job. If a person doesn't like teaching or explain any things to the students or to others, forget about the students, he cannot explain things to the uh, things to others. They should not come forward to write a textbook. Because first job is to explain things which are not known to the students. Second is the textbook writer should make himself or herself competent to provide current useful subject matter through his or her textbook. Suppose a person is working uh, for a public sector company for several years. He has a brilliant academic career, expertise in suppose uh, chemistry. Now the question is, should he write a textbook on chemistry? Suppose one publisher approaches him for writing a book on chemistry because the publisher knows that he is a very brilliant student, he has a good academic career, and uh, therefore he, he, he has been approached. Now the question is, whether he should write the textbook? You cannot say that he should not write. He can be a good textbook writer if certain conditions are fulfilled. First is he knows what is going on these days in the uh, uh, educational field in high secondary level in several uh, stages of the education. And he knows the current thing related to chemistry, current uh, advancement in chemistry, what is going on in the field of chemistry, he is always up to date in knowledge. Uh, so he is able to provide current information. He is, uh, he actually enjoys teaching or explaining things to others, though he is not a teacher, he enjoys it. If he enjoys it, it is very good. Uh, one thing uh, is important because you see, if a teacher doesn't enjoy teaching, he cannot be a good teacher. But if that particular official enjoys teaching or uh, explaining things to others and he has up to the knowledge, he keeps himself up to date. But he knows all the advancement in chemistry, he led, and he is competent to write the textbook. But if a teacher, he doesn't want to know new things. If syllabus is changed, if curriculum is changed, the first, uh, first statement that comes from him is that, oh, these things have been changed. I will not teach these new things you young people should do. It generally happens. We all are familiar with such kind of situation. 
then uh, my personal view is that he cannot be a good textbook writer. So uh, the moral responsibility of the textbook writer is to keep himself up to date in knowledge or keep himself updated so that he can provide current and useful subject matter through his book to the students, not only to the students, to the teachers. The textbook writers would remain updated by acquiring and applying knowledge. Application is also uh, required. So in most of the textbook nowadays, actually syllabus has been changed in all the subjects. And therefore, in the new syllabus, you see there is application part. What is your view? That is the application. Uh, do you think that uh, right to education has been properly implemented in India? Give your view. That is the applied part. So not only the uh, students should know to apply the knowledge that he or she has got from the book, from the class. Therefore, first thing is that the textbook writer should remain updated by acquiring the knowledge and applying the knowledge. She should also be able to explain why there is price rise, why there is fall in rupee value. Otherwise, how can he write on the value of money? Next is textbook writers who try to maintain the high standard of writing quality. It should be a quality work. And there is no excuse for that. And produced work which is easy to understand for the targeted readers. And another moral requirement is that the textbook writer should remain ready to rewrite and revise you have to accept the fault that are found in your book that's why in the trick ways we write that all the uh, suggestions from the teachers or uh, readers are invited suggestions are invited from the readers from the audience that's written in every textbook so textbook writers would remain ready to rewrite and revise it should not be adamant if you are adamant you cannot learn anything next is the author should revise the edition at appropriate interval suppose you wrote a book 10 years ago and the book is still going on and you are not ready to revise the book but you know suppose the book is on tax system textbook is on tax system of india so there is several change from value added tax to gst okay and uh, you stopped the textbook you ended with the uh, recommendation of the raja Salia committee and no further revision of the book and so the students will not learn what are the new changes in the tax system of India? It will end in that. That is with the recommendation of the Rajasalia committee and no further inclusion in the book. And after Rajasalia committee, suppose your book is very good to be intelligible for the students. But what thing is clear? You are depriving the students. You so revise the edition at appropriate interval because you are the textbook writer you have the responsibility to give all the uh, information or the idea about all the changes that are going on in the field of course the textbook writer should be extra concise that his book doesn't contain any false or unfair statement that can harm the reputation of a person or organization it will actually harm his reputation also okay you see uh, 
there is uh, uh, there is uh, an item in the syllabus that is uh, that is MC Andrega. Okay. So you write that MC Andrega is not successful because you are experienced in Assam is dead. In Assam, it is actually not so much uh, truthful for the uh, BPL people. Uh, since uh, lockdown, actually, it is working successfully in Assam. And so from this experience, you mm, wrote in the book that uh, M.G. Andrega is not successful in Assam, as well like in India. But you see, it is very successful in other states, uh, Bihar, Urisha, etc. So you are giving a false uh, statement of judgment in your book. It will harm. So it's so, and you have the responsibility to be unbiased. You cannot be biased in writing. You cannot favor someone, some policies, or some government, or some parties. Next is when there are multiple authors. Suppose you are writing a book with two other authors. Now the question is, who will be the first author? You were writing a last part of the book. So you are the first author. You are coordinating with other authors. So you are the first author. And other authors are co-authors. But they should have to give the recognition as co-authors. Uh, we all know that these days, APL score is associated with this co-authorship. So uh, he, they should, authors, should also get the recognition. So at the time of writing, at the time of uh, preparing the manuscript, it should be uh, made final that you will be the co-author, I will be the uh, first author of the book. Now another question is related to him. Suppose uh, one person is writing a book on uh, a subject X with two quarters. Now he has to cite certain person from the unit that he wrote from the first book in the second book. He has to cite a paragraph, suppose, from the first book in his second book but the first book is written with two quarters and the unit from which he has drawn this paragraph it uh, is actually uh, not written by the quarters he himself wrote that unit now the question is should he acknowledge the contribution of other authors while citing the paragraph, while citing that uh, sentence or whatever it may be from that book, should he include the names of authors? The answer is that he has to, he take the responsibility of citing the names of the authors while citing from the first book. Because though the second book is not written by the quarters, but in the second book, he is utilizing a paragraph or sentence or a concept from the first book. So if it is under copyright, he has to take permission from uh, the quarters. And if it is not uh, uh, under the copyright pr protection, or if it is, forget about the copyright protection, suppose you have a very congenial atmosphere in your college and the uh, uh, quarters are your colleagues uh, in the department. So you have a very cordial environment in the department, so there is no question of any legal fight. Okay, but despite this, it is your responsibility to acknowledge their contribution while citing in the second book. Though the second book is single uttered by you. 
Next is citation is required of all ideas that are borrowed from others. Citation is required. You cannot expect it. Next is textbook writers should not think of providing compensation to a academic institution for the adoption of textbook written by Inok. You cannot go to any affiliated college that you should purchase or you should uh, run my book in a college. I'm ready to uh, uh, give you 50 copies free. You cannot say so. It, it will mean you are morally corrupt. You cannot think of driving others to run a book. So the big question related to ethics is actually say no to three things, plagiarism, copyright infringement, and unreliable data. So uh, I think you have already obtained knowledge about all these things, parallel plagiarism, uh, copyright infringement, and uh, a Copyright Act of 1957 and recent scenes in 2021. And you have the knowledge of UCC rules 2018 regarding plagiarism, etc. Uh, because I have seen your brochure from which I have an idea that these things have already been taught <laughs> and discussions, of course, truthful discussions were held uh, from seven to eight, from seven to yesterday onwards. So I will not explain the strange state's technical terms. I like to concentrate on the moral aspects relating to textbook writing only. First is ask yourself, should I cite common knowledge? So common knowledge, or you can see knowledge which are in public domain, which are known to all. There is no need to cite common knowledge. Let us suppose you are to write a book on India's independence or the changes made in Indian economy after independence. You are to write a sentence that India got independence in 1947. We all know, even your students know, India got independence in 1947. You don't know, even your students, even your seniors, even your teachers do not know who first wrote that India got independence in 1947. It's a common knowledge. This sentence was included in your class three textbook. This sentence was included in your uh, high secondary political science book. This sentence was included in your uh, uh, six semester textbook. So who will cite as a source? That this is the person, this is the book who wrote in the court independence in 1947. So there is no need to cite common knowledge because it is the knowledge that everyone can easily access. So citation is not required. If you uh, charge in Google about the independence of India, that the first sentence that will come is India got independence in 1947. So uh, uh, you were rather safe in this case. There is no question of honesty here. You can cite common knowledge in textbook. You should not cite common knowledge in textbook. Second is, should I paraphrase? And how? Paraphrasing without crediting the original author is a form of plagiarism. You have to uh, cite the source correctly. 
it should be completely rewritten in present author's words. Okay. Suppose uh, you are taking a paragraph from a book and just uh, changed two or three words and reproduced it in your book. That means you plagiarized because it will fall under violation of uh, this citation uh, rules because it is a dishonesty. You are not ready to give credit to someone for his or her work. That's why you are just, uh, you are, are publishing the same, just same, by changing two or three words. So paraphrasing without crediting the original author is a dishonesty, it is theft. Next is, can I reproduce my own work from another book? As an author, actually, I cannot add a part or whole of my previously published work to another textbook of mine without proper citation and acknowledgement. And I have already given you an example. So I would not like to elaborate the point again. Similarly, I cannot use data which have already been used in one of my books published a few years ago. Of course, you can if you cite and acknowledge. Take one example. You have written a book on statistics. And in the chapter on central tendency, uh, you have given a lot of examples. Now you are going to write a book on statistics. And in this syllabus also, there is a portion on central tendency. Now the question is, should you reproduce the chapter? You should not reproduce the chapter word by word, actually. You can cite certain examples. You can withdraw, uh, you can draw certain examples from this. You can take certain examples from what of the examples, no doubt, from the section that you have written in the first book and adding the second book, but with proper citation. But I cannot claim it to be new work by paraphrasing my own previously pub published work. That is, if I paraphrase the sector on central tendency in the first book, and claim it as a new book, then it will fall under violation of citation rule, that is, it will fall under uh, plagiarism, self plagiarism. Because you are to cite the chores. You cannot call it a new work because you are paraphrasing your own work. Not others work, of course. You are paraphrasing your own work and claim it as a new work. Actually, UGC also doesn't give you the credit for it. Next is, what type of data I should be used? In case of primary data, manipulation should not be done. Uh, now the question is, in primary data, can anyone do manipulation? Suppose you are writing a group uh, on which a person is on project. So you are giving some sample projects. You have collected data regarding SSG's contribution in economic upliftment of the people of a particular area. 
and your data so that the result is not desired actually the result so that these people are not actually benefited from this so what will you do you have changed, uh, you have changed the data there was increase in income by 1000 you increased it by 10000 in this way and uh, present it as 20 or 30 percent increase suppose uh, as an average increase in individual income of that area. students will get a different idea from this this is your fabric something that SAG is actually uh, helping all the people in economic upliftment. There may be certain exceptions also. They may be helping the people in economic upliftment, but not the way in which uh, you have so. <laughs> that means you have manipulated data in order to so what you have achieved. regarding the contribution of SAT. So uh, it means you are biased, you are manipulating, it means you are biased. You are doing something which should not be done, which is morally unjust. Second year, secondary data should be from reliable sources. Government data, data from international organization like IMF, universities, reputed private organizations like CMI, reputed research institutions. It should not be from the sources like uh, Wikipedia, because if you change something to Wikipedia, they will accept it in its face value. That is, they will not suspect it, they will include it. Or someone, suppose your friend has sent your concept or your idea or your article to the Wikipedia and they have accepted it, which uh, later found as false, then it will surely do harm to all the people, not only to the students, not only to the teachers, but also all the people who will read it. So source should be reliable. And for a uh, textbook purpose, actually, the, uh, it is better to take materials or data from government sources. And it can be obtained from WordPress, of course, wordpress.org. All those organizations, when there is ac.in, gov.in, okay, wordpress.in, so from those reliable sources, one can take data or information. Next is informational text should be simple and easy to understand. So uh, suppose you are writing a book on uh, for the students of Assam is major, second semester. So it is, uh, suppose the sector is on narratives. This term is used in different way in economics. Actually, 2013, uh, Nobel Prize in economics went to a very uh, different or new topic that is narrative economics while writing the book or writing on narratives or the role of narratives in literatures in literature english literature or your uh, in your language origin language then uh, suppose you are you feel very excited that i should inform the students that there is something regarding narratives is going on in the field of economics. 
So you will want to cite certain example. So you just uh, cite example of 1930s depression that this depression was early at fault as a result of economic factors. Now it was explained as uh, a result of economic narratives. It is just an information, but nobody from SMS literature can grasp this. Why? Because you're just giving the information. You may not use very uh, difficult words or um, unintelligible uh, words or sentences there, but it will not be student friendly because they are not familiar with this type of things. You have to explain it or otherwise you are to aid it as extra person. First, you are to explain narratives, use of narratives, to, uh, then you go to depression. Okay, it is a big sum. Then uh, you go to depression and de what are the psychological factors of depression? What are the economic factors of depression? Then only you can cite with the okay narrative economics. Uh, it is a new subject developing tape in uh, certain things from us. So it should be easy to understand for the students at all costs. And that is sure should be mentioned in the textbook. It is necessary so that others can access from the same. Suppose your book includes a table containing data, GTP data up to 2020. Source is given as it is from uh, this ministry. Okay. Then the teacher who is teaching in uh, the current year 2022 can find the relevant data, current data from that source. It will benefit the students, and all the textbooks are to benefit the students. That's why the authors would. Write the chores clearly. Now, I still like to ask the question to you. To quiz this question of ethics or morality is related. How can I make this PPT platters free? Can anybody? from the participants surveys. Should I ask you, uh, participants, can you make this PPT plagiarism free? How can you? Are you listening? If any participants would like to offer anything, then they may switch on their microphone and address. Okay. Pardon me, can you all listening to me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just want to ask. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. Yeah, I just want okay. to ask the participant. Can you? Charges me, how can I make this PPT plagiarism free? Consider it as a textbook. 
you will learn a new thing that's why i'm asking you okay <laughs> Okay, uh, we who want to uh, talk. Somebody is on. Shall I open it up for questions, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. I think um, everyone today here has no misgivings in agreeing me that this is a very exciting session. Uh, the address man delivered was precise, crisp, and lucid. Uh, it was divided into two sections, which added an extra layer of coherence without any disjuncture. The first section um, was on the process and the logistics of writing textbooks, and the second was on the ethical issues involved in the entire and what we the entire um, endeavor. So, firstly, we focused on the reasons for writing textbooks, which may range from lacuna in the particular discipline experience gathered from teaching or any other such concerns. The targeted demographic for uh, consumption of the state textbooks, whether college or university students, whether conventional or vocational courses must be taken into account, as to say. The materials required for the textbook, the logistics involved, and the indexing, indexing to focus on. In addition, that is the length, the chapter demarcations, and the title. So, as we underline, drafting the manuscript is one of the primordial aspects of textbook writing. We focus on adopting a standard, uniform, and uh, similarly paced narration throughout the chapters of the same manuscript. Of course, um, diagrams, tables, illustrations must extend with the text whenever required. Uh, the veracity and the legitimacy of any information and claims must be supported by citations. In order to make the text more appealing and uh, comprehensive, they should be elucidated by use of examples, which may be drawn from the immediate environment to which the reader may be familiar with. At the same time, the textbook should be inclusive and um, should not cater to students or readers with particular skill set or expertise only. The chapter should be sufficiently summarized, and any instructions, exercises for the readers should be included at the end. Uh, towards the concluding section of the textbook, the reiterated glossary, bibliography, and any standing instructions from relevant authorities should be incorporated. Bibliography is emphasized as a moral obligation of the author. The draft manuscript should be intensively, intensively proofread. Um, and one requires a strong eye for details for this. Authors may conduct some forms of pilot runs by means of craft tests, and any changes, changes that may come up may be incorporated. However, it is not recommended to include major changes in the proofreading stage. As not every manuscript passes to an editor, one must be particularly cautious about the details, details involved. Uh, in the second section, it, it revolves around the myriad uh, ethical responsibilities expected from an author. We focus more on the moral dimension of the issue. Uh, only an individual who is competent and updated on the topic and has the aptitude of conveying information without ambiguity so it should advance towards writing a text. The author uh, should try to maintain the highest standard of quality in their work, which at the same time should be comprehensible for a targeted demographic. The author should be prepared for rewrites and revisions as and when they arise and should not be rigid and adamant. The information of claims in the textbook should not violate or infringe upon the reputation of any individuals or groups of individuals or should not have any undue bias or prejudice for or against any such individual. In case of joint authorship, the order of authorship should be mutually and unequivocally determined. And citation, series reiterated, constitutes the crux of the exercise as the moral of the things are concerned, including one's own, own work and the replication of previously used data or paraphrasing previous work. However, um, common knowledge or conventional wisdom may be excluded from this. With this moral obligation comes the responsibility of upholding copyright, avoiding plagiarism, and other such issues. 
In case of data, primary data must not be manipulated to any degree under any circumstances. Secondary data should always be from reputed, recognized, and reliable sources. And the source of each and every data must be incorporated in the text so that others may also access them. So basically, to sum up, uh, Dr. Pierre ma'am offered a succinct glance, glance of the process, uh, the requirements, and the ethical dimensions involved in the in writing text. So I hope all our participants have benefited greatly from today's session. I hope it opened up new avenues of thought and conversation for approaching the issue of concerns. And I must thank ma'am again for accommodating us with her schedule and enlightening us with her kind and wise words. So now I open the session for questions and comments. Please keep them brief, precise, and respectful. You may either post the queries in the chat box of your Google Meet interface, or you may raise your hand and address them directly to the speaker. And in addition, the feedback link is available in the chat, um, chat box of your Google Meet interface. And the session code is women, W-O-M-E-N. I repeat, the session code is women, W-O-M-E-N. And now um, the floor is open for questions. Okay, uh, can I take one minute? Uh, I have asked a question that how can I make my PPT plagiarism free? I have not obtained the answer, but I think I should tell the answer. Uh, all the PPTs, all the slides are actually prepared by the sources, uh, materials from the Creative Commons sources. I think you already have an idea regarding this. So uh, this can be obtained. These are uh, Creative Commons licensed work. So while we use in academic purpose, we can take information from this. And in that case, It is not necessary to cite, just mention the chores. If I mention the chores here uh, at the end of the uh, slide, then it will fulfill the purpose and save me from plagiarism. So this is for your information because we take teachers generally require those information, videos, uh, images, even in your textbook. If you uh, need a diagram on price discriminating monopoly or uh, any diagram on uh, how the atom works, you can take one diagram from this Creative Common uh, license to work or from the public domain, or you can say from uh, a common. Uh, uh, from those sources which fall under common knowledge. That is, you can directly use the images from a particular website or YouTube in your textbook. But in order to fulfill the requirement of being, a, being an honest author, you should mention the chores. It doesn't mean that it is uh, uh, actually open to all, everybody can use. That's why you need not write the chores. That is not uh, actually, uh, it cannot be suggested actually. You should mention the chores. It is not that these things are common licensed or you can use at any time, anywhere. It is, uh, it should not be think in that way, you should mention the chores. And second thing, I would like to uh, give you certain classroom assignment. If you all are ready, are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Are you all like to uh, do certain assignment? All are ready? Okay. 
So uh, just wait for one minute. Okay, I would like to discuss certain assignment. So I will be very happy if you kindly uh, interact. Let us suppose same topics are to be taught for both graduate and degree level students. How should you write a book? First assignment is that. How should you write a book? Is it visible? Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Perhaps uh, it will work better if I start from the beginning and go to the last, then it will be wider. Yeah, just one minute. Okay. I think it is now uh, visible. It should be postgraduate. There is one, <laughs> yeah, there is one mistake in a assignment. Let us suppose same topics are to be taught for both postgraduate and degree level students. How should you write the book? Can anyone give me an idea regarding this? May I say something, ma'am? Yeah. OK, so uh, I think if I am uh, writing a book for undergraduate le level, according to my understanding and experience, maybe I will start with some basic concepts and then move on to the topic. And for postgraduate, if I'm writing a book, maybe I will directly go to the topic because uh, given the fact that they must have already studied the basics or have dealt with the basics in their undergraduate level. I think that's how I will approach while I'm writing a book. Yeah, good. Any other response? Any other response? If anyone would like to speak, they may switch on their mic and address directly. Pardon me. It was not audible actually. Someone has said something, but it was not audible.
Any further response? Okay, one thing is clear. You cannot write a single book for both graduate and postgraduate students. There must be two books. So syllabi uh, will be different and therefore books should be different. Start with the basics and degree level and for postgraduate higher level is recommended. Okay, good. Paris, it was from Rima, I think. Uh, no, ma'am, it was me. First, you go, Swami. Yeah, good. So, come to the second one. Let us suppose you are to include a new topic in the textbook on macroeconomics, which is relatively new. Of course, others can replace this word macroeconomics. Any topic. Okay. Take any topic. Let us suppose you are to include a new topic in the textbook on uh, X, which is relatively new. You lack expertise on that, but your books have a wide market. What will you do? You are suppose you are a good writer. You uh, have been writing for several years, and so uh, there is a market for your books. For your books, matlab your textbooks. Suppose uh, you were to include a new topic now in the textbook on um, X, which is relatively new. Though you are an experienced writer, you lack expertise on that. That is the problem. What will you do? I would like to hear from the participants. I may respond, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, you gather the required expertise. I mean, take your time, then uh, write it. Or you may, uh, you may collaborate with someone who has the expertise. I mean, that's, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah. Any other response? Ma'am, there are a few in the chat box, actually. OK. Uh, it stops, actually. If I open the chat box, Vikram, uh, I'm going ahead. Okay. Can you uh, 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 two or three uh, response or more than that? There are two responses, ma'am. One is from Diti Borua. She says, I may edit the book and ask the expert to write that particular topic or I will train myself on that topic and then write. And then there is another response from Jyoti Bora. She says, I will study the new topic thoroughly, will gather some knowledge and then will include the topic in the book. Okay, good. It is actually the best answer if we take the help of an expert in that subject. Because knowledge requirement will take time. You have a market, no? you have a ready market of your textbook. So uh, you will not like to lose the market first. Okay, but at the same time, you will like to uh, be an honest writer and therefore it is better it will be according to me based answer that you will hire an expert on that subject and ask him to write a chapter or write on that topic 
with due credit that is important you will acknowledge it okay and at the same time you should include one thing that is the uh, actual work you should uh, seek the uh, copyright permission from the original author if it is a new concept suppose like it is narrative economics okay so you can uh, uh, ask for copyright uh, permission from professor robert Schiller and can cite it or include it in your textbook so that the student can get the chance to read the original because we teachers we textbook writers cannot underestimate our students they can understand better than us, us also okay so it is better second if you have the time okay uh, because the topic is new newly introduced if you uh, don't have any time you cannot gamble wait time okay so in that case you have to hire the expert otherwise if you have the time you should elaborately study you should thoroughly study all the materials re related to it and after that if you, if you feel that still i am uh, incomplete i'm not competent to write on that then go for expert okay thanks to you all take the uh, third question let us suppose university has given a syllabus for a newly introduced course on which you have already written a book your book has come to the market a few days ago now suddenly university has modified the syllabus what will be your reaction definitely you will be in a dilemma so how will you uh, react Uh, Ma'am, uh, yeah. is it that uh, you have already written the book, but then after the, after you have written the book, the university has changed the syllabus? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, there is a response in the chat box. Yeah, so uh, I'll, yeah. I'll, I, I, yeah. I'll, all right. If you can see that, what should I read down? Okay, I say I I I shall see this. Okay. It is a very tricky answer, no doubt. Okay. Regarding the first one, uh, this is given by DT. Uh, one thing is clear that you can't do anything because it has already been verified and your book is in the market you cannot withdraw first thing is that you cannot withdraw because the publisher will not uh, let you do so but there is one dilemma that uh, will it be just because the student will get half a portion or suppose 80 percent of the syllabus on that book and for 20 percent what you should do so in that case uh you pass the information 
to the uh, stu to students, to teachers, to uh, institutions where your book is a market that you are going to republish the book by the edition of new topic and you should take the responsibility to bring it in due time and if it is not possible if your publisher is not ready then what should you do then only one thing you can do then you can publish certain leaflet type of work or you can uh, uh, send the required information or the, uh, the, the uh, conception uh, anything regarding the conception or new item to the affiliated colleges or the university or the institution in uh, in which this book has a market that is the student for the students benefit it is your responsibility to send the new i uh, uh, send certain things or send the write-up regarding this to the uh, institutions and after that if your publisher is ready there is no problem because 80 percent is already there for 20 percent you will add something okay so if your publisher is ready then there is no problem if your publisher is not ready then you have to help the students in that way so that you can retain the market and wanting reputation as well and do the moral responsibility of helping the students or updating the students weight uh, mean chains with the chains that has been done in the chillers okay that is my view if you have anything you can add to it actually uh it is a real situation uh when uh cbgs was introduced first then what happens in one book uh, uh which was uh, written by a reputed uh, reader and published by a reputed publisher and it was found that one person was not according to syllabus actually i uh, myself found that it was according to the uh, first syllabus okay then the syllabus was revised at the time of introduction syllabus was re uh, revised in my subject actually i'm telling with an incident in my subject actually uh, uh, i found that uh, sir uh, included the portion according to the original syllabus that is the first syllabus and then I told the publisher because the same publisher publishes my book also and therefore I told him that uh, it is according to the first syllabus and some modification is required and the publisher uh, readily accepted it and informed the writer and uh, he also passed the information that he is going to change and in the next year he changed it okay of course we the just made, made up the uh, deficit with our own effort but uh, it is good that uh, writer also admitted publisher also admitted it but it requires times to publish something new that's why that time was taken uh, next uh, i would like to ask another question that is uh chapel so you have three choices for study materials one is uh mooc source other is uh creative common source and third is a book that you read several years ago to uh, write a textbook okay along with your expertise and experience okay so what source or what type of source you should select ma'am could you repeat the three things today yeah suppose uh, you are going to write a textbook and you have three choices of study materials one is mooc source you just mooc source and uh, m o m w -O c h mooc source then uh, there is uh, uh, suppose uh, creative commons and other third is the uh, 
it is a book that you read uh, several years ago. Then what will you do? Uh, Ma'am, uh, yeah. book and Creative Commons license are not always good, reliable, uh, right? No, no, a source, as a source, book yeah. has not Creative Commons license, but the yes. source has. All right. Uh, there are a few responses in the chat box. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, it is good that all the sources should be consulted. You read a book several years ago, suppose 10 years ago, then you should read it. That is the only addition I uh, should it to it because MOOC source, uh, Swayam source, Ipachala, all these are very good source. Not only for textbook writing, for all the students, it is a very good source. So MOOC source uh, should be utilized, but you have to mention it, you have to cite it. And if there is copyright, then you have to take the copyright permission. Only then you can use it. Then uh, uh, second is uh, open sources are generally given as uh, Creative Commons open. Okay, so search it first, whether it is uh, open to all. Then uh, uh, Creative Commons for the Creative Commons of uh, of course. Uh, you won't get everything there, but whatever is possible, you can utilize for, from there and read it, the book. Okay, that's good. Uh, I would like to. Uh, Hello, Amit Jai. Yeah. DT is saying something. DT, are you saying something? Okay, then I would like to. Perhaps see his network problem. Okay, uh, I will like to share with you uh, an incident. Actually, we should. Uh, uh, we should not happen. Actually, this incident was given. Uh, was told to me by my uh, told to me by uh, my publisher the, actually at the time of C introduction of cbch what happens what happened at that time uh will be astonished to uh, actually know when uh, there is one or two months left for the introduction of cbcs two persons came to the uh, came to my publisher in Guwahati and told him or uh, that they both prepared a guidebook for the first paper of CBCS for semester and asked him to publish the book. My publisher was shocked. What is this? There is no textbook till then, and there is a guidebook. So he asked them that from which source you were uh, you, you were writing this guidebook, because till then syllabus was not fixed. 
I think you understand the situation. There is no textbook. Syllabus was not fixed because it is a, an all India syllabus, no doubt. But 10% is at the hands of the universities. They will modify accordingly. And uh, all the publishers are waiting for that at the time. A book, uh, not a book actually, a guidebook came to the publisher. So he was sobbed and asked them to write a textbook. Why not you were writing a textbook? We are writing a guidebook. And you are not ready to write a textbook. Of course, he did not publish the guidebook. And he uh, told me the incident over phone that what is, uh, you see, ma'am, what is happening in the market. So uh, this is the situation. This should not be done. This should never be done, actually. If we textbook writers want to be morally just, we have the responsibility. We should, if possible, we should give them good textbook, quality textbook, but should not go for this. But I can't deny the role of guidebooks because guidebooks are required for extraordinarily meritorious students, also for preparing the different examinations, JAA, NEET, etc. For this, it is required. You cannot uh, actually deny it, but costing, we should give the students to read good textbook. With this, I would like to conclude my lecture, but I must admit that I enjoyed this uh, session. And thanks to you all for the participation, for active participation. And and thanks for other thing also that you have participated in such a truthful workshop because I know would be authors from this uh, session, would be authors from this workshop, will be the wonderful ones. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I hope the participants found the session to be very engaging and stimulating. And uh, I thank you, ma'am, again for finding time for us, for joining us, and uh, for enlightening us. And uh, <clears throat> with this, I'd like to conclude today's session. Uh, I offer my gratitude to the to the organizing team for putting up such a regular schedule, such, and with such uh, well-known experts uh, for our benefit. And for the participants, your Feedback link is available in the chat box if you have not seen it yet. Uh, the, session, uh, the session code for today's uh, second session is women, W-O-M-E-N. Uh, so thank you, and we'll see you again uh, tomorrow.